Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to Black Muslim Girl Flies Friday feature. Today is the last Friday of Ramadan 2024, and I'm feeling a little sad because I love Ramadan. However, inshallah, we'll see it again next year. And to celebrate, um, Black Muslim women on our Friday feature today, I have a special guest, Binta K. Jallo, a singer-songwriter, and it is today April the 5th, and she will be joining us from Chicago, actually, so because of time zone differences, she will be taking a, a brief break to break her fast in the middle of our talk today, so welcome. So for everyone who doesn't know all, all about Black Muslim Girl Fly, we are a nonprofit organization founded in 2018 with the purpose of uplifting and empowering Black Muslim girls and women and our unique narratives. And we started off with our first film festival back in 2018. And we had three consecutive years of successful festivals in Los Angeles and online in 2020 in COVID. Um, and inshallah, our plan is to relaunch our BMG Fly Film Festival again this year. All right. She's joined us, so let's welcome her into the video to get started. And hopefully we will have a wonderful chat before she has to break her fast. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Wa alaikum salam. I can. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Doing okay. Um, unfortunately, I'm having difficulty hearing. So let me see. Maybe there's something going on with my audio. Okay. Um, just one moment. No worries. And, and um, while we're waiting, um, I see some folks joining. So I wanted to add, please ask questions get involved, join the chat. This is a, a conversation and we enjoy having you all uh, with us. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, let's get started. Um, just one moment. Oh, see, that's not what I meant to do, what? audio. <laughs> no all problem. right, so first of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us and um, tell us who you are, where you grew up, and what you do now. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Binta Kanjalo. I grew up in Chicago. We kind of bounced around a lot in the city, so I don't really have a side whenever anyone's like, are you South Side, West Side, North Side? <laughs> um, I'm kind of just claiming Chicago, period. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm Senegalese and Gambian. And currently I am a singer, a songwriter, and I serve as the Associate Director of Arts and Culture at an organization called Iman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network here in Chicago. Okay, something's wrong with my audio. I'm sorry. I apologize. No worries. I am so happy. I think it might be my microphone. No worries. Do you want to tap oh, off and then you can pop back on? Can you hear me? I can hear okay. you, but kind of kind of low. Um, do you want to tap tap back in, maybe? No, no. I think this is this is perfect because now I can hear. Before I couldn't hear anything you were saying. I'm so sorry. No worries. No okay. worries at all. Can you hear me properly yeah. now? Perfectly okay. now. Perfectly now. So I was telling everyone before you hopped in that you are going to take a break to um, break your fast when it's time. Mm -hmm. um, but before that happens, let's just jump right into it. Um, this is all about empowering Black Muslim girls and women. And you are an amazing singer-songwriter. Tell us how you got into that. Like, when did you feel the call to mm -hmm. do that? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, mashallah. Um, I felt the call to do this when I was about seven years old, um, but I felt the call to do it properly and, and uh, publicly when I was 28 years old. Wow. 
Um, so I actually always sang in my room to myself or I would sing to my younger brother or, um, you know, friends that I had, but even my parents, I'd never would sing for them. Um, I actually had a really, well, to me, it, it seemed traumatic, but to them, they probably just thought it was a cute little kid singing. And, but, um, when I was very young, I decided I wanted to sing a, a Mary J. Blige song to my family. And, um, when I sang the song, you know, I guess they thought I was just super cute, but everybody started laughing. And so I internalized that as though they were laughing at me and like my voice and and that I couldn't sing, you know? And so I just never sang again for them. Um, and it wasn't until high school where, you know, I, I, I joined choir for a little bit, never really had any, you know, mainstream um, visions for singing in that way or, or singing like, you know, solos or things like that um but it wasn't until i went to iman actually for an artist retreat that we did in 2018 and um i was given a beautiful opportunity to share in front of a variety of artists from all over the world um and i wasn't anticipating this but uh, my dear friend and brother phenom uh, pushed me up onto the stage after another dear sister of ours, Caleb the Poet, uh, informed him that she heard me singing just like in the hallway. Um, and so literally he was like, yeah, you guys have seen her behind the scenes. Now it's been to turn. I, I literally thought I was going to throw up. Like I was so scared. <laughs> be I was so, yeah, I was so nervous. And um, yes, yeah, so I went up there and I started singing and alhamdulillah, it, Turned into such it turned into such a beautiful moment, um, not only for myself but other people there that didn't necessarily see themselves as artists. Um, they might have seen themselves as like you know curators or scholars or um, teachers, but in that moment, a lot of people started to pour into me the fact that they've always wanted to do something and they you know might not have really strived towards it. Um, and so from that, alhamdulillah, a lot almost open a portal for me to be able to do that. So I'm grateful for that. That sounds amazing. It's always a friend who pushes you, you know, you sometimes need that nudge, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm humbly led. I mean, hearing that fire started as young as seven, that's amazing. And a lot of people don't necessarily have the calling for what they want to do until they're adults. Mm -hmm. um, but most creative people that I know, it always started when they were little. And I'm the same as for me. Like, I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. I was I was probably three when I read this amazing book that just blew my mind. And I thought, you know what? I want to do that. I want to make stories like that. So, yeah, I understand. Like, and as black Muslim girls, we need that. We need that push sometimes to, to say, you know, you got this. You got this. <laughs> True. Yeah. So when did black Muslim girl fly into your life fully? Yeah. For yourself and not just the organization, but your own black Muslim girl fly? That is a good question. Um, honestly, I would say I've always been fly. Like, mashallah, I've always loved fashion. Not just outwardly, but like, yeah. I've just always had this demeanor about myself that like to carry myself um, well. Um, and my mom, by way of her mother, who I'm named after, always taught me that you should always, you know, look your best and present your best in, in any space. And that includes your character. Um, and so I've always done my best to do that and like rectify my character. But obviously, as I got older, that got better and more refined. Um, but regarding like just the essence of being fly as a Muslim woman, um, I would say for me, it truly began around 2016, 2017, um, when I actually used to volunteer for where I work now. And um, I was just surrounded by such beautiful women that were hardworking, they were um, striving towards excellence and they covered. Um, and, you know, in my family, we, we are Senegalese and Gambian. Um, most of my family dresses um, very modestly and not even most, everybody dresses very modestly, but not everyone necessarily um, covers their hair. And if they do, it's a specific, you know, type of vibe or style. And so 
um, one year, this around this 2016, 2017 time, I just felt like I had it on my heart where I wanted to begin covering. Um, and it was really difficult for me. And I just felt, you know, the, the call in my heart. And so I just kept asking Allah to, you know, make it easier for me and like make me want to do this. And it just one day it was just, all right, today's the day. And, and so I, I slowly was able to develop my own personal style as well when it came to hijab and like what I wanted to wear, what I didn't want to wear. Um, and as a black Muslim woman, being able to make it fit culturally as well um because as, as we all know um muslims are not one culture muslims are um so vast and we we look so different in, you know across the world um and so wanting to be able to incorporate west african vibes into like how i dress how i speak how i act um and wanting to also emulate just what i've been witnessing and incorporate that in my own way um and my father actually is um, a tailor by trade. Um, he was a tailor for about 30 years and he no longer does it, but uh, one of his first jobs was uh, working with Dapper Dan in New York. Um, and so I've always been around fashion and clothes and fabrics and patterns and things like that. And so I knew that once I did, you know, firmly commit to um, dressing a certain way i wanted it to be a certain vibe for me <laughs> um so yeah one of the folks in the chat said one of the flies black women i know uh, so uh, come thank on. You so much. she's so sweet Masha, that's one of my friends facts. uh Michelle. facts though but i hear you like you were saying you went to high school and you joined the choir um was that a muslim school or a public school that was a public school um, I actually did not go to Islamic school um, and I, I know why that is like my parents had to make that certain decision for um, our family and my mom you know did her best mashallah to raise us up in um, Islam and make sure we learned about the the proper etiquette of being Muslim and what that meant and how to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and I, you know, being born Muslim, I've learned that we all have to come to our, our own, you know, shahada moment at some point in life. And so um, I feel like for me, I've always believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've always done my best to, you know, to strive towards being the best Muslim that I could. And, you know, again, we're all human, so we, we do struggle in different ways. But um, I feel like as I got older, that's when I was able to really come to my moment and say like, hey, like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm choosing. This is mm -hmm. the path that I'm on. Um, and praying for a lot to, you know, make make it easy for me and learning more about him and learning more about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, honestly, I, I feel like, you know, I'm 33 years old, but I, I feel like a newborn what? in Islam. Yeah, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> I never would have guessed that was your age. Yeah, mashallah, I'm 33, but I feel like a newborn when it comes to Islam, because I'm, I'm so curious and I'm always asking questions, even if it's the smallest things. And, you know, especially because I didn't go to Islamic school, a lot of people assume that I know certain things. And because I, I cover, they just assume that I, I know like Islam from like back in the day to now. I don't like I literally no. don't. Um, and so I love that Allah has um, placed this sense of urgency and this sense of seeking on my heart. Um, and so that's what else I appreciate about um, about that. I love yeah. it. You know, I I grew up in Muslim schools. I, I'm a proud um, graduate from Sister Clara Muhammad School. Mm -hmm. And that was... <laughs> back in the 70s when I, <laughs> um, but I did go to public school for high school. And when you were talking about the way that you dress and showing up in your best, I really took that as a part of my mission, being the only Muslim girl in my entire school and mm. being a black Muslim girl at that. So, and I went to one of the oldest all girl public schools. Actually, it is the oldest all girls public school in the country yeah. in Baltimore. Yeah. And if you know about, about Baltimore culture, you know, fashion and, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, I had to show up and show out 
even with my scar, I wore a kimar. I pinned it in the back, you know, and my mother used to help me make clothes. I would have, and the girls would be like, like Nia, how do you match your scarf to your clothes like that? <laughs> I'd be like, Talk about a tailor. Mm, mm -hmm. I had a seamstress at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I understand like what you mean about showing up in your full self. And especially when you go to public school, that's rough, you know, especially when there's no other people who look like you. Yeah. You know, so I really feel that. So um, yeah, and if there are other girls out there who are in a similar situation, just know that you can own it and rock it and be your own black Muslim girl fly without a hesitation. You know, yeah. we got your back. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it, it's so true. Cause you know, like society makes it seem like you have to look a certain way or you have to follow the trend, you know? And literally the trend is a never ending target it's literally always moving and it's always going to change and so what's most important is following the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing you about your own self and like what is your vibe what how do you want to portray yourself in the world and um that is something that i wish i kind of knew in high school because um in chicago i went to a really diverse high school but i was one of few african kids and so um i didn't really have a lot of people that looked like me and so um just off jump most of the people that i uh, uh, um was affiliated with were you know either white people or african americans um indians chinese people but you know there wasn't anybody really west african except for like i think there was like these two twins that ended up coming later on um and so yeah I, and at that time i wasn't wearing you know hijab i wasn't covering um, I was still finding my own little personal style and God bless my parents. They were very, very um, okay with me dressing however I wanted to dress, which is not the norm in a lot of Muslim households. No. Um, Cause so. <laughs> I've stories about sneaking up the house. So. <laughs> it's not the norm. And, and I, I do think, Alhamdulillah, it's because, you know, I'll praise to God, my dad, like I said, was a tailor. So, you know, I, I got away with it a little bit, um, but what i will say is if i when inshallah if i have a daughter i definitely will let her know like hey i'm comfortable with you living your life and figuring out what you want and but what i want you to to know is that you know you perceive your own self as well it's not just about the perception of others but like how do you want to show up for yourself how do you want to love on yourself and how do you want to be loved on and unfortunately, in the world we live in, it is all dependent upon looks sometimes right. and where, where you are. And if you and I heard this a long time ago, I can't recall who said this, but it's about, you know, um, your story and like your internal story, exactly. you know, and the fact that if you don't know yourself, somebody else is going to tell you about yourself and you might hold on to that. And it becomes like your internal wiring for years and you have to kind of, you know, untether yourself from that, which is difficult. So if you rather start earlier, so then you have less untethering to do. Absolutely. I was literally about to say that it's all about the story that you tell yourself about yourself, the story that you allow others to tell you about yourself. Mm -hmm. It's and it's all interwoven, mm -hmm. but the most important story is the one that you listen to from Allah, the mm -hmm. one that you can hear mm -hmm. bubbling up inside mm -hmm. you. That's that's why BMG Fly exists. I needed to hear my own story and I needed empowerment. And I was hearing too much from other people telling me how I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from my professional life, you know, in L.A., um, pitching television shows and having someone tell me, well, uh, this doesn't sound like an authentic Muslim story, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm a Muslim and I wrote it and it's based on a true story. So what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So like, I had to like pull back and say, these stories that I have about myself are authentic and they're real and y'all about to get them <laughs> exactly. exactly period literally and you know um i just thought about my my dear dear sister uh, and auntie angelica um the village auntie mm -hmm. auntie angelica Lindsay ali she just made a post recently i would highly recommend everybody check it out but it it said something along the lines of and i'm paraphrasing so please go to her page um, okay. but 
it said something along the lines of um, what story about yourself are you telling Allah? Yes. And I was like, yes. Auntie, yes. you've done it again. <laughs> well, like, is she in my journal? Like, oh my God. <laughs> that's literally, oh my God. That's literally what I've been trying to tell myself this Ramadan. Mm -hmm. That's how so important Ramadan is because it allows you that private time with your creator. It allows you that time to listen to that voice, to mm -hmm. create, like you just said, the story that you're telling Allah about yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, like I started writing as a little kid, but I've been a writer my whole life and writing in journals is so cathartic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's also your story because if you go back and you read your journals from when you were 12 and you read your journals compared to now look at how your story has arced yes look at what you've gone through you know and that's literally what bmg fly is all about you know owning yep. your own narrative and taking the driver's seat when it comes to that you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and our new guided journals uh, I'm so excited about them, actually. I posted a video today. I'm going to just show you mine because I, I write in mine. This is oh, the, the black. Oh, I need this. Yes, it's amazing. And I love it. Like my gratitude pages and like, um, but wow, there's one for, for um, younger. Well, I like it too because it's purple. But <laughs> let me show you. Mm -hmm. And it's very much all about owning your story, wow. you know? And it was like, Allah had inspired me to put them into journal form. Salaamu Alaikum, Aliyah. And Salaamu Alaikum. It, it's, it's more like this mission because I have a daughter, you know, mm -hmm. my daughter is, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, my daughter is gonna be 29 in December. No, she's not. Yes. Wait, what? Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Ah. Anyways, I think I'm having like a midlife crisis here. <laughs> no, yes. I would have never guess that. Like you were talking okay. about me. Yeah. I thought we were in the same age. No, I'll be 50 this year, inshallah. Allah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really wow. wanted her to understand. Like you were saying, you can own your own style. You can create who you are, tap into like what, what you want mm -hmm. your life to be and you shape that and it's storytelling, mm -hmm. you know? And because we're in Ramadan and there's reading of the Quran, so <laughs> 50 and fine. Thank you, Aaliyah. <laughs> there are so many stories in the Quran that I connect to mm -hmm. that I'm sure you probably have yeah. as well that keep you going, you know? So like, tell me, like, li listen, tell me some of the stories you've been reading <laughs> during Ramadan and how they've impacted you. I know that's not on our list, but no, it's what yeah, we're talking about. <laughs> no problem. Let's do it. I'm going to, I'm going to share this. And I think this is like a perfect segue um, for me to break my fast right after right. this story. But um, you know what has really been helping me? I'm actually going to show you all this book, but um, the chapter on uh, Surah Maryam, um, and just learning about just how much she trusted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, her tawakkul, her, her steadfastness, her understanding, like her beauty and just listening, like literally truly listening. Um, that has really been getting me through as well as Surah Yasin. Um, Surah Yasin is like meant to be or it's said to be the the heart of the Quran. Um, and so that is something that has truly been helping me just to kind of like soothe my, my heart, my heart and any anxieties that I might have. Um, and what I've truly found in that surah um, is also like healing. It's just, it's just, I mean, the whole Quran in itself is medicine for us, but that surah in particular um, has a lot of verses that are very healing and soothing to the soul. Um, and one of the things that I remember just through all of the videos I've been watching and you know lectures I've been listening to is that even though I might not necessarily know how to read Arabic or understand a lot of Arabic, my body remembers it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in there. Um, so immediately, I don't know if some of you all noticed, like when you pray, 
your body is swaying like your body is like going closer towards the words because it in itself is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just our mind like literally our soul is worshiping Allah our spirits um our bodies all of our senses everything is in alignment at the same time worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so the more that we tap into that and like really listen and ask Allah to help us with our discernment we'll be able to notice the signs like what does he say again paraphrasing but um about you know something about how there's signs for those that notice um and for me i'm more than happy to be the weird person that's going to be like hey like do y'all see those birds praying yes. <laughs> you know like i'm okay with that i'm totally <laughs> fine with that because like i love it and I, I love the fact that everything in the universe is praying at the same time as me or the same time i should be you know um so yeah so with that i need to align and get get this prayer yeah. in real quick um break so i'm gonna fast. go break my fast and then i'll be right back alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. so yes we'll be here okay so while we're waiting for abita to come back i wanted to go back to what i was saying about the guided journals because honestly i did not I plan to talk about the guided journal, but she really brought it out because she was talking about the stories that we tell ourselves. And that's literally why I created the guided journal. And alhamdulillah, the Ramadan planner that I um, uh, created for this Ramadan also. And when you have the, the time to sit down and really like internalize what you're reading, the stories of the prophets and, and the journeys and the struggles and Maryam, her journey, her story as a mother, as a single mother, as someone who was accused of something um, that was totally out of character for her and being um, the mother to this blessing, this messenger, this miracle, you know, and the fact that um, self-care was so important that she had practices where she would isolate herself for prayer even before Isa, um, alayhi salam came along she would isolate herself for prayer hey salam alaikum welcome and Maryam, speaking of Maryam, my my niece Maryam just jumped in to the chat hey boo um talking about somebody named you're named after <laughs> um but her story was one that inspired me to practice self-care because um, taking the time to have quiet time with my Lord, with my creator and reflecting on my du'as and my prayer, you know, that was so important. And then I was reading more about her story and how she was inspired to take her son away and live someplace where it was peaceful, near running water and it was beautiful. And I thought to myself, the sister knew about self-care like that's something as a mother you have to take care of yourself because you are taking care of children and as the mother of children in our community we are their first leaders and so it was so important for me this ramadan to connect with that with that example from her and and find time to find peace for myself and um yeah and i am a mother even though my children are adults now but they still need me just like i still need my mother and she still needs her mother it's generations of us needing each other and that is so very important and it's so also very important for us to know how loved we are that's also a part of self-care understanding that Allah loves us. And one of his 99 names is Al-Wadud, the all loving. And that is very important to hold on to because honestly, if you know that you are loved unconditionally by the creator of the entire universe, if that doesn't give you motivation enough, you've got a whole list of 98 other names that you can go through. But that love is very powerful and Allah is our provider and our protector. And the, all those 99 names, I put them in the journals because, you know, when I was a little girl uh, going to school in Sister Clara Muhammad School, we had paintings along the lines of the walls of the masjid of all of the 99 names painted so beautifully in gold, like shimmering painting. And 
I was, I was a mischievous little kid and I always like got sent to the Mosella because I was a little disruptive. But honestly, I'm starting to think maybe I was doing that on purpose because I wanted the solitude. I wanted to be in the Mosella and I used to read all the 99 names as young as four years old and just find peace out there while I was doing my schoolwork. And so um, if you do get the journal, you'll see there's a section in the journal that's dedicated to all 99 of Allah's names. And um, it's this section. And they're all in gold calligraphy, just like when I was a little kid. And so, yeah, this, this journal is pretty special. Um, but the reason why it exists is to connect you with yourself and with your creator and the self that you are is inspired by your creator. So that is the most important relationship that you have in life is the one with your creator and yourself. And then everything else is gravy, you know? <laughs> but once Binta comes back, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how um, fasting and her profession as a singer and performing how they interact with one another and i know that there are some folks out there like my niece mariam who is an athlete who have been juggling things like if you're a professional athlete or a professional performer it could be challenging to manage you know balancing your faith and your responsibilities and we've seen it in the public eye with so many professional football players and basketball players who are Muslim and who are still fasting while they're playing. It's, it's something that we as Muslims, um, it's not, it's difficult. I'm not going to say it's not difficult, but it's not something that we shy away from because it's a part of who we are. And honestly, I would love to hear um, Binta share about her experience with that. And um, definitely want to talk about a little bit more of what's coming up for her professionally. But um, while we're waiting, if you'd like to ask questions, please do. We had a few questions a little earlier, um, but just type them in the chat. And then, um, yes, we're going to have a little chat about being Muslim and being a performer and and balancing all of that. Welcome back. Waalaikum salam. All right, so I know you had food. Can you, do you want to share? I know you told me. All yeah, that. <laughs> actually, I would love to show you all this. Hopefully, um, I'm gonna eat more later. But I'm very grateful Good. that my mom actually just made some fried plantains, um, and I'm so excited to try these. Um, and so, yeah, I honestly, man, Allah is just so merciful for me when I was younger. I used to struggle a lot with the food aspect of it, like the food and drink, as we, you know, most kids do. Um, but as I grew older with fasting, I think what I struggled more with was like releasing things that I overconsume, like outside of food and outside of water and really testing myself and challenging myself to really um, work on that like so i can really take in whatever else a lot needs me to take in um instead of just saying like well yeah i'm just fasting for food and water like i mean mashallah that's not an easy feat for anybody like it's not it's not just doing that and we i think we know that because ramadan is such a special time um we a lot gives us some extra like oomph to really push through it and to get past it but for me it's now about okay like how am i spending my time like mm -hmm. am i going to the masjid more am i reading quran more am i um you know watching less of what i might have watched outside of ramadan am i right. being mindful of what my senses are taking in you know um and so those are the things that i'm kind of working on a little bit more and more but um i'm grateful because especially as an artist um when you're singing and and you you have a show prepared and you know you have to break your fast it can be a little bit difficult mm -hmm. um and i know for me like recently somebody invited me to this really really dope iftar called uh, iftar in harmony mm -hmm. and i was meant to perform i believe uh before maghrib time but then i ended up performing after maghrib mm -hmm. and it was like a while after so i was i was starting to get hungry and you know the food was looking 
delicious and I wanted some water and all this stuff. So I, I broke my fast, but um, what I noticed is that certain things affect my throat. Um, and so I can't have like certain fruit or something like that right before I sing or certain food. And then especially spicy things, it, you have to be really careful because then you might be singing and all of a sudden you like burp on the mic or right. that's like one of my biggest fears. Allah protect me. <laughs> um, and so, yes. Uh, and I, I know that there's so many people that do this because we're doing this like for the sake of our Lord and also our gifts are our gifts because Allah blessed them with, he blessed us with them you know and so I want to be able to properly utilize my gift and my body as a means of amplifying Allah and like amplifying what he wants me to share with the world by way of my gifts and um, I want to do that in the best way possible so um, it may look like not uh, choosing to perform at a certain time because I know that I I would like to have eaten, you know, or um, if I can't while I'm fasting, making sure that, um, you know, I'm, I'm really tapped in right before that, saving my vocals, um, not speaking as much right before, um, praying over my voice, praying over my, my breath. Um, just to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for the strength to be able to do it properly. Um, and then, you know, the fast is over and, and you can do whatever you want. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yes, I can tell. Like, um, listening to you talk about your process is so, um, I have so much respect for that because it takes a lot of energy and we as the audience don't necessarily see that side of it. Mm -hmm. But I definitely, as someone who enjoys hearing your voice and your singing, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. And I love to hear you say that you're tapping into your gifts. Because as another sister um, I had on here, one of our board members said that as a singer, you know, she felt like her singing was her her worship. Like mm -hmm. that she was tapping into the gift that Allah had given her. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I know that there are some other folks that I've known personally who struggled with that because of cultural implications, like mm -hmm. the patriarchy kind of is like, you know, we want to keep you under wraps as, mm -hmm. a, as a woman. So why are you trying to be a performer? But mm -hmm. at the same time, I acknowledge that Allah gives us gifts mm -hmm. and it's our responsibility to honor that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, I did think about that for years. Um, and one thing I realized is that I'm at the point now that Alhamdulillah, I'm not fearing any man. Like I fear Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that's it. All period. Like you know, yeah. I'm not, it doesn't like it doesn't. What does them telling me what I can do with my voice have to do with what Allah gave me? You know what I mean? Um, and for the longest, I would be afraid and just like, oh no, like you know, I wear hijab, like I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't. And the thing is, everybody has different opinions. Like, and I'm not here to say that you know women should be or shouldn't be doing certain things. What I'm here to say is that for me personally, I believe that Allah is blessing me with this voice and this talent to write to be able to uplift communities, um, to be able to amplify voices of people that may not necessarily feel comfortable sharing in that way, to be able to represent the ummah in a, in a beautiful light um, and to be mindful of what how I'm using my gift. I'm not out here using it in any other form other than amplifying love and amplifying uh, uh, resilience as well as amplifying um, just honor of like honor of self honor of what has been yeah. given and honor of what is to come and as well as honor of what has passed you know and so we got another performer in, in in the chat who said the same thing it's our responsibility to honor our mm -hmm. gift as a performer recording artist i approve this message thank you Leash. also dismantling stereotypes yes come on mm -hmm. So it is mm -hmm. our responsibility as Black Muslim women to show other Black Muslim girls that there's no box that you have to fit into, you know. Mm -hmm. And part of BMG Fly was started because of my aunties when I was growing up. Like, mm -hmm. I can name them off the top of my head. Sister Intasar was the big auntie who I learned that I'm, I shouldn't be afraid of any man, mm -hmm. you know. My aunt Sharon, who wasn't Muslim, but she was still my auntie and she taught me about my own BMG fly, mm -hmm. you know, 
standing up for myself and what I believe in. Mm -hmm. So like, if I didn't have other black women along with my mother, whom I inherited the passion for education and learning, and I became an educator because of that. And if I didn't have those examples, you know, I don't know how I would have come up with my ideas. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, like Leash said, we are not one dimensional. We're not at all. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so grateful that you had the, the just strength to push through and to persevere and do this because it's so needed. And, you know, honestly, the more resources we have like this, the more people are able to um, have less that they need to heal from mm -hmm. in the, when they get older, you know what I mean? Um, and for me, to be honest, like, this is a newfound freedom. Um, for, for years, I, like I said, I didn't sing in public and it wasn't because I was afraid of people saying, you know, I shouldn't be singing. It was more so because I didn't believe in myself and I, I didn't feel like I was good enough to sing in that way. And there's a lot of like comparison that kind of was um, implanted onto my mind. And that is something that is a, a trick of the devil, you know? It's literally a, a trick of the devil. Um, and the, the devil's biggest goal, or I'm sure he has multiple, a lot of protectors, but one of the biggest is separating families. Mm -hmm. And I feel like because I felt so hurt at a young age, I didn't process it properly. I didn't even sing for my own parents. Like, you know what right. I mean? And so it's one of those things where now because I started tapping into the gift and because I started utilizing it and continue to grow and ask a lot to help me in it, I've been able to be blessed with multiple circles and spaces that allow me to do it in such a beautiful way, as well as perform on stages that I never would have like thought that I would be performing. And alhamdulillah, like things have just been given to me. Yeah. And, and, and because I'm being grateful and because I'm using what I have. Um, and what I noticed is that even though I was so scared, I'm, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm going to do it. And this is another thing. Sister, I just said something. She says, have you all discussed imposter syndrome? But go ahead. Tell me what you were about to say, because I want to hit oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely will. Um, so another and I, i'm gonna talk about her to the end of time mashallah sister angelica literally has saved my life so many times and oh, mashallah. like please again y'all check out the village auntie but um I, i've taken numerous courses of hers and a lot of the times like i i think about just internally how much mm, how much damage i've done to myself just yeah. by the stories that I was telling myself and, and um, truly believing these things, you know, and um, what I noticed is that Allah gives us so many opportunities to get out of that. And we just have to really like aim for the best and, and have a really positive opinion of Allah subhanahu yeah. you yes. know, what I mean? that's the period of it. And, yeah. you know, and I don't know if you want me to just hop into the imposter syndrome piece because I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> no, I agree with everything you said because it totally does tie into imposter syndrome because I, it's, and and I think it's living in America, being a black woman, being a black girl, you know, growing up in this country. And then on top of that being Muslim, it's like a trifecta. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm going to tell you, like I, I was telling my therapist the other day like i have told myself all these stories about myself that i inherited from the people who used to abuse me and i had not really made that connection until adulthood and she said you're right you're right because when you're a child you don't understand that and i said i had to sit down and like rewrite the story rewrite the script and like we were talking about earlier listening to allah you know prayer and meditation and taking time for yourself. That's something that as the eldest daughter, I've never really been comfortable with taking time for myself. And in fact, I came to the realization that I was committing a crime against myself. You know, I was not doing what Allah wanted me to do, which is to take care of myself in the same way that I was taking care of my family. And so those ideas, those um, expectations that were placed upon me, I started to internalize and think that this is what, you know, I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And then eventually, 
when you feel that bubble up of no i really want to do this but ah uh, i have to fit into this box and i have to do this that's where imposter syndrome comes up yes for me i'm speaking from my own experience because when i'm in my element for example when i'm in the flow state and i'm on set and i'm shooting a film and i'm in the groove i'm not thinking about that it's only when i hear that little voice of mm, muslim girls shouldn't muslim girls shouldn't you know you know and then it's like wait i'm second guessing myself should i be doing this like mm -hmm. is it wrong for me to be taking charge of this situation like am i supposed to step back and get out of the spotlight mm -hmm. but those are not those aren't my voices that's not allah's voice that's mm -hmm. that's other people who wanted to minimize what i was doing and when other people feel insecure around you they the people who don't know how to regulate their own emotions tend to take it out on those people and make them feel small so that they feel bigger. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, I battled with imposter syndrome for years, like literally for years. I, I never thought that I was supposed to be in the place where I was meant to be. And in that in itself is is like a lessening of trust trust in, in Allah's plan mm -hmm. and a, a lessening of trust in um, what he wrote for you. You know right. what I mean? Like, and mashallah, Allah loves us so much that he's given us an abundance to, to even dream. Like just any thought that you come to your, that comes to your mind or comes to your heart is something that Allah wants you to ask him for, it's you know, gift. it's a gift. And, and I don't, I don't mean like, you know, things that are haram or like right. negative or something like no, that. No, I feel you. Any positive thing, you know? And um, I was reading this book by Rick Rubin. Um, I think it's called The Creative Act. Yeah. Um, and he was talking about, you know, sometimes you'll have an idea come up and then if you don't hop on it, maybe a year later, you'll be like, oh, dang, I just saw this on TV. I was thinking about doing that. But the thing is, we let we hold ourselves back so much because we yeah. think that we can't do it out of fear mm -hmm. or we think that we don't have the resources. And what we have to realize, and it's easier said than done, but at the end of the day, what we have to realize is like all of the, the risks, like the, the abundance, the everything is coming from one source. It's not coming from a job. It's not coming from you. That's it's not coming from anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so just realizing that, hey, I wanna do this thing. Let me tap in with Allah. Let me find out about his names and let me ask him, like, you know, look, you're Al-Malik Al-Mulk, like literally the king of kings. Bless me with this thing that I want, <laughs> you know? And it might not come in this life. It might come in this life. I think that's what, even for me, I struggle with, like, Man, I want it in this life now, like, and let me see if it's possible. Mm -hmm. But I also want what Allah wants for me. That's something that I have amended my du'as to include. And I've shifted my mindset to where I, now I'm going to like, it sounds a little goofy, but I don't care. Um, but I've been talking to Allah since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And so me and Allah are best friends. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> <laughs> you remember that you remember that book are you there god is my yeah. Like, hey yes i'm not crazy i'm not <laughs> the only one <laughs> so like whenever i'm making dua i start to shift it to oh allah i want this make it good for me if that's what you want for me like mm -hmm. i want what you want for me allah mm -hmm. and that it's like another level um, of my trust, you know, elevating my, like you said, the tawakkul is so important mm -hmm. because everything comes from Allah, yeah. everything. And there is not a leaf that falls that he doesn't know it, mm -hmm. you know? That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite ayahs. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also one of my mantras to remind me that Allah knows everything that I'm going through, even my sore throat, Allah knows, <laughs> you know, and if I make a dua and I ask Allah, please soothe my sore throat, I don't even have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. I know it'll get better. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even as yeah. small as that. So yeah, alhamdulillah. Yes. And, and this is not to say too that like, we're not going to get nervous, right? Like, I feel like 
anything you do, it's going to come with some level of nerves. If it doesn't, something's not okay yeah. with you. <laughs> like, you need to maybe ask, like, just be a little more humble, you know? But right. I, I get nervous every time I sing. And it, it might be a different, you know, it varies. It might be, like, a little bit nervous or, like, a lot nervous, depending on what I'm doing. But um, I always pray over my voice and, like, just pray for a lot to let it reach people's hearts and ears with remembrance of him as well as reach me with that um and also just to protect from you know like the evil eye and things like that um because yeah there are a lot of people that don't think that black muslim women should be doing a lot of things um and, and you know being an artist is is one of them but at the end of the day uh, what a lot of people don't understand is that um art is the way like art is healing we come from the greatest of artists, you know? Um, even if you just look out during Maghrib, like, like while it's time for us to break our fast, look at how beautiful the sunset is. Like, look at how many colors there are, how many variations there are. So we're, why are we not meant to be just as beautiful? You know what I mean? al Musawwir, the fashioner, you know? Exactly. Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to live in a place where I can see the mountains mm -hmm. and the clouds and the sunset is so beautiful, like pinks and purple and orange. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I, I run out there with my camera sometimes and Alhamdulillah, like you said, that is art. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for you pointing that out to me because all this time I was looking at Allah's mastery of storytelling because, mm -hmm. of course, that's my that's my jam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it's so true. Allah is also a master painter and, you know, a sculptor and and the sounds of nature. Like I can listen to the birds outside for days and it's it's beautiful. It's relaxing. And that's how music feels, you know. So those of you who are out there, young Muslim girls who want to get into art, don't hold back. You know, it seems scary. Like Binta said, it is scary, you know, if you're not nervous about it yeah you gotta get a little humble <laughs> mm -hmm. but no yes and that exploration will also get you closer to your creator as well as get to know yourself more mm -hmm. you know yes truly and also what i'm realizing again is like don't compare to anyone literally we come in this world alone and we're leaving alone yeah so on your path like just act as if you're doing this for a lot and a lot alone and like don't look at anybody else's paper and i'm talking to myself as well Thank like you. it's not even about me wanting to compare myself it's just we're so different like there's not one person on this earth that is you or that they can try but they're not you you're you're you know we're we're amazingly fashioned as you mentioned and amazingly designed and even if you're a twin you're still two separate souls you know um and so just digging deeper to figure out where does allah want to place you and once you figure that out how can you use that placement to um act as an act of worship you know what i mean and like that's kind of what i do and even with my journaling uh which i'm really looking forward to getting your journal inshallah but with my journaling um I used to be nervous to, to kind of write things down because then it makes things real. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you have to get it out or else you're suppressing so much. And that's what I love about songwriting is because it doesn't necessarily have to be about one specific thing or one person or a story or you even. Um, and it can help people. It can save people's lives. Like literally knowing that they are not alone and what they're going through. Um, and also just to be able to process properly, um, you know, through the writing, you know. And so I've been writing more. Um, and I actually wrote a song uh on ramadan day like the first day ramadan started a song kind of like came to me and um i'm not one of those artists that can kind of just like write out of nowhere like some people can which is so beautiful but for me 
it kind of just comes in waves. Um, so I'll, sometimes a sentence or two will come and I'll just record it on my phone real quick or a melody will come or something like that. And then I'll just start journaling about it and like writing it out. Um, but as Muslims, I, or as a Muslim, I am afraid sometimes about being too vulnerable in my songs. And so that is personally what I'm working on. Um, because again, I do want to show up um, for the Ummah and show up for my family, show up for myself. But at the same time, um, I want to tell my story truthfully. You know what I mean? Um, about why, while being mindful of, of other people. Um, and one of my favorite teachers and singers on this planet, um, her name is Marmona Yusuf. Oh, and oh my goodness, yes, I yes. love her. And and let me I've just learned... say this, Marmona, if you're watching, I love you. Um, <laughs> we grew up together in Baltimore, and oh. her music is like uh, like water to mm -hmm. me. Like so, yeah, humbly laugh for you, Marmona. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I love for her truly. Like I've learned so much from her about just writing mm -hmm. and. Um, singing and, and her whole family, they're just so yes. sweet, mashallah. Yes. Um, I am just so grateful to witness people that are Black Muslim women and indigenous women listening and like pouring into the earth by way of their voice and pouring into the human like family by way of what Allah is telling them to do. You know what I mean? And so that's what I, I want to do and that's what I aim to do is continue to grow in that um, even though I might be nervous even though I might think my voice sounds weird sometimes but that's it like I'm going to do it you amen. know man amen I love it mashallah your voice is so beautiful mm -hmm. I I just want you to know mm -hmm. that because yes and it's very important for us to honor ourselves you know mm -hmm as black Muslim girls and women, we're not often honored, you know, and Malcolm X even spoke about it. We're the most disrespected on the planet. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I remember having a professor in graduate school um, when I was at Johns Hopkins and she, another black woman, and she pulled me aside and she said, Nia, you are going to have to toot your own horn because nobody else is gonna do it for you. And she had the neck mm -hmm. movements too. So. I remember, I will never ever forget it because it was a lesson that I received as a blessing as well. Yes. Because nobody ever like pulled me aside and, and told me, yes, you know, toot your horn, like say how great you are. Because in a way that is also worship. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite ayahs in Quran, Allah says, and proclaim your Lord's favors. Mm -hmm. You know, that's at the end of Surah Duha. And I, and I use that as my motivation. Like, I can't wait to proclaim my, my favors, Allah, you know. So, yeah, don't be afraid to step into your greatness. And, and I'm, I'm speaking to myself again, yeah. you know. <laughs> truly, truly, literally. And thank you for reminding me of Surah Duha because I need to say that Surah today. Um, I, unfortunately, I, I lost a ring that uh, it was an akik ring i got a custom akik ring the prophet muhammad used to wear a kik and um i got it this year in january on my first ever time going to umrah and i've been wearing it every day and it's been like reminding me of my time there and reminding me just about the power of prayer and everything and i lost it this morning oh, wow. uh, and my 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 coworker was like, yeah, read Surah Duha, and you know, so whoever's watching, please make dua on this ring. Um, inshallah, it pops up somewhere. I'm making dua right now. Like I'm asking Allah to return it to you Thank because you. It's, it's, it sounds so precious to you. So yeah, alhamdulillah. No, I know um, we're at our one hour mark. Oh my goodness, we could chat for, for a lot. Yeah. Oh, but I know you have to go to pray and um, inshallah, I will be breaking fast soon. Nice. But I, I am so honored to have this conversation. Alhamdulillah, thank you for joining us. And before we do go, I want you to let everyone know what's coming up for you professionally, how we can find you and follow you on social media, as well as any performances that are coming our way. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Nia. I, I'm so grateful and honored to be able to spend this time for you. I hope we can do a part two another day. Um, but yes, I have a lot going on um, right now. Um, I'm on a, a heavy um, 
feet to write, to be honest. So I, I really need dua. That's really what I need is dua um, for people to pray for me, to be able to have everything that I need to share come out properly and in a healing way. Um, I, I just had a few iftar performances and different performances, but I will be posting about others as they come on my Instagram. You can follow me on at uh, Binta Singh, so B-I-N-T-A-S-I-N-G-S. Uh, also, feel free to follow where I work, Iman Central. Uh, we do amazing work in the community. We are a uh, um, health center. We are a ceramic studio. Um, we have we have a lot of things, um, but we are a, com a community health organization. We'd love to have you all follow us there as well at Iman Central. Um, and I'm skipping on things just because I'm getting hungry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. But um, I, I'm just grateful for everybody for tuning in. And um, if anybody has any questions or would like to learn more about, you know, my art or what I do or just even about your own art and want to, you know, just tap in about that, please feel free to send me a DM. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what would you like to see more from BMG Fly this year? Mm, I would love to learn more from the elders, honestly. Like, I, I feel like our youth is so strong right now, and I don't want to miss any knowledge um, that has been here for for a while you know like i'm curious about what the elders have to say um and i'm also curious about what the really really young ones have to say exactly. like the like the eight-year-olds the five-year-olds i feel like we don't get their voices often so that would be really dope you know what you just planted this idea and i have two nieces who i would love to have on a friday feature mm -hmm. they are those ages oh so, yes uh -huh. Humbly led, like, like everything that I'm doing is not just, is for me and my daughter and my nieces and my mom and my grandma, you know, and my friends. So humbly led, I'm going to take that to heart. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Thank you so much. I pray the best for this org. Like, I think it's amazing. I'm so honored to be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the features. Alhamdulillah. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go and I'm going to let everyone else know. Tune in next week. And if you would like to join in on a Friday feature, please do DM us. And don't forget to follow Binta Sings. And inshallah, enjoy the rest of your Ramadan. On the other side, we'll see you at Eid. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, Binta. Have a beautiful night. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bye.